Welcome to the Real News Network. I'm Gregory Wilpert, joining you from Quito, Ecuador. Protests and mobilizations continue in Catalonia, Spain, where the region's independence movement is fighting for a referendum on self-rule. Some analysts say that one of the issues that has propelled the drive for independence from Spain is the region's relatively strong economy. Catalonia makes up about one quarter of Spain's GDP, while its population is only one sixth of that of the rest of the country. However, Spain's economy as a whole has been growing rapidly since it emerged from recession in 2013 and is now one of the European Union's fastest growing economies. This is in stark contrast to Greece, which remi remains mired in depression and to which Spain used to be compared. But just how did Spain emerge from its economic crisis of 2011 to 2013 and what does it mean? Joining us to examine this question is Mark Weisbrot. Mark is the co-director of the Center for Economic and Policy Research and is the author of Failed, What the Experts Got Wrong About the Global Economy. He joins us today from Washington, D.C. Thanks for being here, Mark. Thanks, Greg. Thanks for having me. So uh, you just recently returned from a visit to Spain, and you've been paying close attention to the Spanish economy. As I mentioned in the introduction, uh, since 2013, Spain's economy has been one of the fastest growing economies in Europe. Um, the policies pursued uh, by Spain after its recession were marked though by austerity. Um, does this mean that austerity worked in Spain but not in Greece? Tell us about what happened according to your analysis. Well, it's not doing that well actually. Um, you know, for the four years of the recovery, the the growth isn't that great. It just it had they had a decent year last year um, with uh, three point two percent growth and 2.8 percent projected for this year but if you look at the overall statistics that matter to people especially um, unemployment for example is over 18 percent right now and it would be a lot higher if it wasn't for 1.7 million foreign nationals that have left the country and you have poverty and social exclusion is 20 the people at risk for Poverty and social exclusion is over 27 percent, and inequality has increased uh, drastically uh, since 2008. Um, it's the ratio of the top 20 percent to the bottom 20 uh, percent is now at seven and a half, which is uh, the third worst in the European Union. And even for people who are lucky enough to have jobs. Uh, the majority of them are only getting uh, temporary contracts. So all of this is really not a picture of an economy that's doing very well. It has a long way to go before you could say uh, that it's really even providing the basics for the majority of people, and especially youth. You know, the unemployment rate for youth is, is twice the level uh, of the overall rate. And uh, this is really a pretty bad situation. And if you look at, you know, what the IMF, which really represents the European authorities, because the European directors decide what the IMF writes and says and recommends for Spain. If you look at what they're saying, they want more austerity. Uh, they want... Uh, they're very worried about maintaining and increasing the so-called structural reforms that they think are important uh, for the recovery that they've had, which means weakening the bargaining power of labor, uh, cutting health care spending. These are the kinds of structural reforms that they've had and continue to be recommended. And the worst thing, I think, is the way they've accepted mass unemployment. And again, it's not really just the IMF. It's the government and the European authorities, European Commission, uh, the European Union. They've accepted mass unemployment. So if you look at the IMF numbers, they say that the Spanish economy will reach its potential output in uh, 2019. So that's, you know, basically a year and a half from now. And yet unemployment will still be at 6%, uh, sorry, not 6%, 16%. So in other words, 16% unemployment is going to be considered full employment going forward. And that to me is, is something of an abomination. I mean, I don't see how anybody could accept that as the future of Spain. 
I mean, unemployment was pretty high before. I mean, even far higher. I think it reached almost 25 percent at one point. So they did get it down. But uh, so you don't think that they'll be able to push it down below 16 percent? And if not, why not? Well, the I think the main thing is is uh, fiscal policy at this point. You know, they need to invest more and create jobs. They have, you know, productivity has been very low. So the private sector is not investing enough to increase productivity. They can, there's all kinds of things they can do to create jobs. You know, they, uh, the interest rate at which they can borrow for 10 years is now 1.6%. That's the yield on a 10-year bond for Spain. So they can borrow at 1.6%. And that's actually the rate of inflation that they have right now, too. So in other words, the borrowing is free for them in real terms, inflation-adjusted terms. They can borrow. That's what they should be doing. But of course, the European Union rules don't uh, permit that. And in fact, if you look at you know, how they actually recovered, this is another way to see how bad, uh, how completely wrong the policies of the government, the right-wing government, and the European Union have been uh, for Spain. If you look at what actually happened, how did they recover? In 2015, they grew, you know, twice as fast as uh, was expected. So what did what did they do? What what was the cause of that? The IMF determined that two thirds of that was from the European Central Bank lowering interest rates, which, you know, we can talk about if you want. That's a really good thing, but it wasn't the Spanish government's uh, policy. And uh, from the lowering of oil prices. And the rest of it was due to Spain actually having an expansionary fiscal policy. In other words, it ran bigger deficits than it was uh, it ran deficits, it increased its uh, structural deficit uh, spending, and it violated the terms that, it, that the government agreed to with the European Union. So they did the opposite uh, of what they, were, what they had agreed to do in terms of austerity, and that's part of why the economy recovered as much as it did, in addition to the external uh, factors. So that goes completely against what you know, the authorities, again, the government and the European Union authorities have been recommending for Spain. They've been saying, OK, you've really got to have this austerity because you have to push down wages and make uh, Spain more competitive. And they did manage to hold down wages and they did create mass unemployment, which pushed down wages. This is what's called an internal devaluation. They can't control the currency because it's not, it's the euro. And so the uh, idea is if you can't devalue by lowering the value of your currency, you have to lower these labor costs so that you have what's in it, what's called an internal devaluation. And then you export your way out of the uh, depression. But the yeah, problem is that. Sorry, that, that brings me actually to the other question, there, which is related, which is that uh, clearly an internal devaluation uh, would seem to imply also increasing inequality to some extent, at least for those people who are affected by that the most. I mean, uh, according to a 2016 Oxfam report, Spain is, quote, almost 10 times more, uh, has a greater inequality, almost 10 times more than the European average and 14 times more than Greece. Uh, so is that where this inequality comes from, from this internal devaluation? Yes, and the IMF noted that as well, that what happened was employment uh, fell by about 20% from 2008 to 2013, and it hasn't picked up enough to make up for it. And that's where the inequality came, because the people, that's where the vast increase in inequality came, the one that, that I mentioned in uh, since the uh, since the recession, because it was the uh, poorer workers, the lower income workers that were most affected by the loss of jobs. So you have this inequality. And again, the internal evaluation didn't really work because even though Spain did increase its exports, if you look at what actually matters for growth and employment, which is net exports, that is exports minus imports, that has not uh, contributed anything to the recovery of the last four years.
And so uh, what kind of economic policy would you say that Spain should follow or pursue in order to uh, have a more equitable type of growth and uh, a true lowering of unemployment? Well, they would need a more expansionary fiscal policy. I mean, the European Central Bank has, you know, is engaging in quantitative easing and keeping interest rates low. It took them quite a while. They did it, uh, you know, eight years after the Federal Reserve did it here in the U.S., but they did finally uh, come up with the monetary policy that they needed. And so it's really fiscal policy. It's budget policy. It's you know, as I said, they can borrow for free in real terms, and so uh, they should do that. Or they can also, I mean, obviously they're not allowed to do that under the European rules, so there's, you know, but Spain's a big country. I mean, it's not like Greece. They could uh, try to negotiate uh, that. Uh, they could have some, but they're not going to do that because, uh, well, they're not going to do any of these things because they have a right-wing government. But when they get a, a, a more progressive government, that's one of the things they could do, even uh, without having to uh, go against the European Union constraints. They could also increase employment by uh, raising taxes and spending that, uh, you know, what economists call a balanced budget multiplier. In other words, if they raise taxes and spend more money, they can still create jobs and move closer to full employment. And Spain has a relatively low share of, of you know, a relatively low level of government spending uh, relative to its economy as compared to uh, the rest of the European Union. So there's room for that as well. And I think you obviously have, you know, you've had a lot of resistance to these policies that have given them this prolonged uh, recession and the weak recovery. And the mass unemployment, you have, uh, as you know, Podemos became one of the largest uh, parties in the country after, you know, in just a matter of a few years. That's a, a left uh, party that's promoting, uh, they actually have an economic program that, that uh, specifies exactly that, um, increasing government spending on infrastructure and other productivity uh, enhancing and uh, energy transformation as well um, to create jobs and move the economy closer to full employment. Yeah, well, we're going to continue looking at that, especially since, uh, as you suggested, there might be ch a change in government, especially after these uh, protests and all the things that are happening in Catalonia. And then we'll certainly come back to you to see if uh, they have developed more uh, beneficial policies by then. So thanks, Mark, for, for joining us today. Thanks, Greg. I was talking to Mark Weisbrook, the co-director of the Center for Economic and Policy Research and the author of Failed, What the Experts Got Wrong About the Global Economy. Thank you for watching The Real News Network.